Hello and welcome uh, to the um, second in our series on contemplation as gift to the church. Um, I think we've let most people in now, so I'll, I'll start. It's really um, great to have you all with us here today. Um, welcome if it's the first time you're here and welcome again if you were here last time. Um, so I'm Catherine Morgan Hickey. I'm part of the Heart Edge development team. Um, and I'm uh, involved in this series along with my colleagues, uh, Reverend Catherine Juice and Joe Beecroft Mitchell, uh, who are also with us today um, in this uh, webinar. Um, it's a uh, well, Zoom meeting, really. It's great to have you all here. Uh, we decided to run this series really uh, in a, as a response to the, the growing interest that there is in contemplative prayer and practices. That's been seen over recent years, really, as people have been rediscovering some of the riches of the Christian tradition. Um, and the pandemic and the lockdown during, during that time, it seemed, it seemed that there's been uh, just a further resurgence um, in interest of, as people have really looked for new ways to put down deeper roots in their Christian faith. Uh, and we were particularly interested to explore how contemplation also links with the wider mission of the church so that it's contemplation and actions to explore how they sit together rather than seeing them possibly as being in opposition to each other. Um, so the last time, two weeks ago, we focused on the Nazareth community and the Companions of Nazareth, which are based at St. Martin in the Fields. Um, I think that session was recorded and will be available um, um, for people to, to look at. Um, I don't think we've got it up yet, but that will be available at some stage. Um, so that was with uh, Richard Carter and Catherine Juice uh, and exploring the different aspects of, of the community there. And uh, this week, we're visiting uh, St. Thomas Derby, uh, where there's a new monastic community which has built up over the last 10 years. Um, the session is going to be led by uh, Reverend Dr. Simon Cartwright, who is the prior of the community. He's also parish priest and area dean of Derby City. And also Beth Hawkins, who is the sub prior for the community. And uh, Beth um, describes herself, she's, she's, she's spent the last five years working um, as a stay at home mum to two children. And prior to that, she's been in, uh, worked in libraries. So we'll be hearing from both Simon and Beth over the next hour as they take us through the elements of their uh, community, the, 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 the roots, how it, how it came into formation um, over the last uh, decade or so. So I think we're in for a really exciting and inspiring time, actually, um, as we listen to their story. So I really hope that you, uh, that you enjoy it and that you really see how God is at work um, there and inspires us to see how God is at work around us um, in, in new ways. So what I'd like to do is just start with a prayer. Uh, we've probably all come from all different sorts of things. Some of us might maybe have rushed here. Um, some maybe had a bit more time to kind of enter into the space. Um, but let's, yeah, let's just still our hearts uh, for a few moments. Let's just sit quietly and then I will just lead us in a brief prayer. With you, Lord, you are to be found in our lives. Help us to seek you. You do wonders among us. Help us to see you. You reign over our world. Help us to obey you. You triumph over all. Help us to rise with you. You enter your kingdom. Help us to live with you. So I'm going to hand over now to um, 
Simon and Beth, just to say that the session it's running for an hour and a half until 3.30, and they're going to be sharing their story between them, and then um, at the end, in the last half an hour, there'll be time for questions, and um, please, throughout the time well, Simon and Beth are talking, feel free to put any questions or comments um, in the chat function, and we'll pick those up later and um, ask them to respond. Uh, but please feel free to use the chat function as you're listening, as you and as you feel um, with anything that comes up you want to ask about. Thank you very much. So over to you, Simon and Beth. Well, good afternoon, and it's good to see you all. And um, it's a shame we can't be in person, but it's really good this medium of, of Zoom enables us to speak across the nation uh, to one another and to share our learning. Uh, today, we want to share with you how our personal journey and our journey as a community has taken us deeper into prayer, but how that has in itself impacted on our sense of mission uh, and our call to practice hospitality. And these three themes of prayer, mission and hospitality have shaped us as what has become a new monastic community living and working in inner city Derby. To start with, I want to share with you some of our uh, theological understanding that's come up over the last few years and began to shape some of what we think at St. Thomas Community. So I want to talk about how mission and hospitality start and must start with prayer. We see this conviction in the, uh, the monastic tradition where St. Benedict believed that a community fit for purpose is a community that prays. He argues that out of prayer arises hospitality, service and mission. The prologue to Benedict's rule describes his praying community as the school of the Lord's service. Whilst more contemporary uh, writers like Richard Raw talk about Christian spirituality as being both a gift and a task. It requires communion with God, contemplative prayer, contemplation, as well as action in the world, praxis. When these two elements are separated, then the life and the mission of the church is deeply affected and doesn't move forward. Contemplation without action is an escape from reality. Action without contemplation is activism lacking any real meaning. So we want to argue that there is an intrinsic link between missionary contemplation and contemplative mission. So how do we practically link prayer, mission and hospitality? I'm going to ask Beth if she's able to read for me from Colossians chapter 4. Yep, so it's Colossians 4 uh, verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Thanks, Beth. So we see in this Bible reading that uh, St Paul is calling us to two types of prayer. Is calling us to be watchful and to be thankful. And it's interesting that Paul doesn't call his congregation to preach. In fact, he recognises that as his own calling. That's why he's in chains. But he calls them first and foremost to devote themselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And I see that this call to prayer, this devotion to prayer, is shaped by their watchfulness around the world and what was going on about them. I must admit, I love reading those medieval mysteries. Um, you know, those um, when the, the monk is the detective. I don't know if you've come across them. So I know a series out there now. And, and in the medieval period, they talked about the watch, the people whose job it was, before police were invented, to patrol the streets at night, keeping an eye on the roads and the byways, and to act if they saw there was a crime happening or fire, which was a major risk at the time. They were the watch. And this call for us to pray is a call to watch, to be watchful, to look around us at the issues and the challenges that are facing the context in which we live and we are set. 
And as we look at that and we see that happening, that shapes our prayer life. We are called to shape by our prayer life, by what we see. And if our prayers are influenced by what we see, I think God then acts to make us the answer to his own prayers. And we are called into his mission field to fulfill what we are praying for. This has certainly been my own experience. I love prayer walking, a, a discipline of walking around the streets, uh, connecting, watching, looking at what's around me. And it leads me to pray. I'm constantly praying as I'm walking down the road. I don't know why. It's just it's the place I find easiest to pray. I hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit to see things and particular things as I walk along and to talk to particular people day by day. But I'm not so vain as to think that's only my calling or my journey. I've seen that in the journey of the Desert Fathers the Celtic missionaries, the medieval mystics, the cloistered communities, the religious orders of the 19th century. And what shaped these communities, what was it that shaped these communities was not that they were church plants encouraging people to attend. They were communities of disciples who lived out their faith in the presence of others. It's how they followed Christ and how they lived that drew others to follow their example. They created disciples of Jesus, passionate, devoted disciples of Jesus, rather than consumers of a different type of church. Self-reflection, a commitment to spiritual discipline and openness to the Holy Spirit were a normal part of what it meant to be part of these religious orders and monastic communities. And it's my conviction as a church leader that we're called to form authentic community. Clearly and apologetically built on Christ built on prayer and yet utterly open and vulnerable and welcoming to those who come and meet us. It's a living out of the gospel, being good news to the people we meet. It means that our message is less a gospel proclamation by using just words, but rather it's our very lifestyle that is a presentation of the gospel itself. If our shared community life looks like the gospel, lived in its highs and its lows, its glories and its sufferings, I believe that in itself will be attractive to others. And that's not possible if we just hide behind our walls. People have to see our lives, see our dependency on God. And that's why that second half of that reading from Colossians chapter 4 that Beth read for us is so important. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt. You see, Paul does not espouse some sort of evangelism technique. He doesn't teach us apologetics. He talks about hospitality. He talks about welcoming the stranger. And when you welcome the stranger amongst you, making use of the opportunity to answer their questions, to allow them to initiate the conversation. And I believe our daily life dependent on prayer, living out Christ within us, We'll bring those people alongside us and we will know how to answer their questions because it will come out of our own spirituality, our own depth of that time we spent in prayer and with our Father God. People in my community are getting rather bored of me talking about triangles all the time. I've got this triangle which I'm absolutely obsessed by, but it's a sense that God is at the top of the triangle and that the two corners of the triangle are ourselves and others. And if we try and get a relationship just between ourselves and others, it just goes there, it doesn't go anywhere. But if our relationship between uh, is to God and not to others, it will topple over. But if our relationship is with God, with others, and we work together to get to know God better together, actually what happens is we end up getting closer and closer to one another as we get further and further to the apex of the triangle, to such a point where actually ourselves and others and God are intimately integrated. It's all about reducing the space between us, focusing on God. In so doing, we are formed as the people of God and we become a sign or a sacrament of the coming kingdom. So far, I've been preaching at you. I've been giving you a bit of a sermon. I get carried away. I get very excited about these sort of things um, and I'm in preaching mode. But for the next 45 minutes or so, um, Beth and I are going to have a conversation and tell you our story about how we've lived out that theological principle in practice. So I want you to imagine that you're walking through a busy inner city street 
in the centre of Derby in our case. You walk past the numerous takeaways, the phone shops, the food stores and the smells from all countries all over the globe. Running off to your left and to your right are narrow terraced housing streets, largely occupied by migrant groups who first settled in this area before they raised enough money to move out. A sight common in many of our cities across this city, this country. But here in the centre of Derby, right next door to the health centre, opposite a police station, and a former library converted into an Indian Sioux shopping complex, lies this church of St Thomas. And Beth's going to say a few words about her calling to this particular part of Derby. So, um, yeah, going back to the beginning, um, we moved into this area called Normanton within Derby. Um, and there was something I've been, I, I guess I was quite interested in um, new monasticism as a calling and um, a few years ago, some of the new monastic and intentional communities in America got together to talk about what are the marks of this new monasticism? What are the characteristics of, of this kind of way of life? And the first one on their list was relocation to the abandoned places of empire, which is kind of a fancy way of saying we move to the places that other people are trying to move out of. Um, we recognise God has a heart for the poor and the marginalised and as followers of Christ, we should have that heart also. Um, and part of that is being in the places where that is what it's like. Um, like Simon said, the, the area that we live in is the place where uh, people often end up when they first arrive in this country before they make their money and move somewhere else. Um, it's a wonderful, diverse, interesting place, um, but it's also a place of poverty and crime and dodgy landlords and fly tipping. Um, and in that context, there is a church, as Simon said, and that was also felt like it was an abandoned place. Um, we're going to tell you a bit more about that story. Um, but yeah, I guess we felt called to be in a place like this and to bring um, the light of Christ um, to serve the people who live there. Um, and we were, I guess I was attracted to this um, sense that there was this church building and it felt like that had been abandoned as well, but actually we want to bring new life back into it. Um, and I think Simon has got some pictures to show you of, um, of what the church looked like those years ago. Thank you, Beth. Was... <laughs> so Beth talks about the forgotten places of empire. Uh, and these are some of the pictures that she's just promised. Uh, this is St. Thomas. Uh, on the surface, it seemed a lovely church when I first arrived in 2011. Uh, maybe a bit ragged around the edges. Uh, the stonework could do a bit of a clean. Uh, my children used to call it the black church because of so much um, pollution uh, had affected the stonework that it looks so almost black as you drive past it at night. Um, but when you look a bit closer, yeah, you see some of the challenges. Um, water was pouring down the walls. Uh, there were cracks all over the place. Uh, the building had not been very well looked after. It smelt of damp uh, and uh, the pigeon detritus was everywhere. Um, the floorboards had given way. And when I asked my architect for a bit more of an opinion, uh, they came to survey uh, the brickwork and found moss growing for the brickwork and already eating away at all the cement. And we found that the woodwork was um, was rotten and breaking through. Uh, we were put on the at-risk register by English Heritage uh, because they felt the building was in danger of falling down. And yet something within me would not let this church die. I know it was in good nook. I knew it was next to the police station. I knew it was next to the health centre. I knew people walked by it day and night. But what was God calling us to in this place? And back to back. Yeah, I think like Simon, I felt there was a calling there to this place. Um, and so 
we got together in that damp and smelly and slightly unpleasant and very cold church. We gathered um, around a gas heater to try and keep ourselves warm um, as a small group of people um, wanting to hear what God had in plan for this place and for us um, as a community. So we kind of got together. And at that time, yeah, there was just the beginnings of Simon starting to do some funding bids and things like that. And we were praying for those things and praying for um, for God's will to happen um, and praying for for guidance um, for what what we should be doing because yeah we we didn't really we didn't want to give up on it but it seemed like it was kind of hanging in the balance as to what was the best thing to do um and so yeah it was just a really important time of um that priority of prayer and listening and seeking god for for what he wanted to build in that place it was really important thanks beth i lost the screen at that point i just got it back again <laughs> uh, so please you you please you kept going um as we as we as we met together week after week in that cold damp church uh around a really cronky gas heater which sometimes worked and sometimes didn't work um we felt a call to rebuild the church not just the building but the church as the people of god uh, and beth is going to read uh, from isaiah chapter 61 The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins and shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities and the devastations of many generations. Thanks, Beth. I love this pattern of mission, uh, which some of us know as the Nazareth Manifesto. We heard about the Nazareth community last week. Being good news to the poor, uh, binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming freedom to the captives, release to prisoners. I love the way that this passage integrates the, the social and the environmental. There's comfort there for those who mourn, but there's also a rebuilding of ancient ruins. But it was as I was praying, or as we were praying together, Beth and I and others, uh, in that uh, that damp church uh, all those years ago, that we felt God pointing us to Isaiah chapter 61, but also particularly to the pronouns. For as we read it, uh, verse 4, it wasn't we who were called to rebuild the ancient ruins and restore places non devastated. Rather, it was they who were being called to rebuild. As we reread it very clearly, God is calling his prophets to work with the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives and the prisoners. But it's them, the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives and the prisoners, who will become the planting of the Lord. It's them who will become the display of his splendor. It's them who will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. We realise that God was calling us to form a very different form of church. We saw our role as not just being a faithful presence, we've mentioned that a moment ago, but really being a catalyst for change. Going out into the local community and encouraging the local community to come into ours and allowing them to help us to shape the agenda. So working out who was coming through our doors and saying the opportunities that came before us rather than us trying to set the agenda. Through our care, our support, our teaching, we felt that they would be empowered it's meant not simply meeting the needs of the individuals and the organisations that, that come by way, but rather working alongside those individuals and organisations to equip them and enable them to make change in the area that they know. That was Beth, briefly. So, um, 
that's gone off. She got to at the door, hasn't So what happened was that we um we formed what we called a, a missional community. And best to say a real word about our missional community. Sorry, Simon. Someone was ringing my doorbell. <laughs> OK, missional community. So um, the way that I started out, we were we had a like a small group or a life group um, from within St. Augustine's, which, St. Augustine's, which is um, the other congregation within our parish, which is a much more traditional Church of England church. So we had this group of people and it was, you know, basically about supporting each other, doing Bible studies, kind of standard um, small group things. But we also um, at that time had a pioneer curate who was helping to lead that group. And he was very much looking for new ways to do church, thinking about mission, thinking about um, how to do things differently. So as that group, we kind of decided to shift our focus from just being a group within that church that supported each other to um, how can we be, um, like someone was saying, the catalyst for, for mission or for, for reaching out, um, not just doing church as normal, but thinking about our context and um, not just trying to attract people to a standard version of church, but doing it differently, becoming um, welcoming. Um, and so we, it's kind of this two strands of the, the, the church building and wanting to restore that and us at that point wanting to become more um, connected to the wider community and to do something different. Um, and so we kind of brought those two things together and started to uh, meet together at St. Thomas's and to, to start praying in that, around that gas fire um, into what God had for us in that place. Thanks, Beth. And so what would this look like in practice? And I've got some more pictures for you. Now I've managed to get my PowerPoint working again. I don't know why it was causing problems, but it was. Um, so um, we met... Uh, once a week at Beth's house, uh, she got small kids at the time uh, for prayer and study. Uh, and then twice a month, uh, we would gather uh, together. And we gathered uh, once a month inside the church. You can see the building works are still taking place at that point, uh, back there. Um, and uh, we would have a meal together, uh, a community meal together. Uh, and the other once a month, we would uh, go out into the streets or into the park, uh, put up gazebos, put up shelters. Uh, and hand out three cups of tea and cake, uh, and we would uh, be out amongst our community. And these two sides of meeting together, or three sides, meeting once a week for prayer, once uh, a month for a community meal together, um, once a month uh, out and about in the streets. Uh, and these three focuses of mission, prayer, and hospitality began to become oh, part of our DNA. Was by uh, the people of Brasso. But it was conquered by... Wallachians like Claudio. Claudio. Not sure where that's coming from. Yes, it was very near to the border. Not sure where that came from. Various events. Claudio. Hopefully they edit that out when it goes on Facebook later. <laughs> um, so, um, one of the things that we did as we did these pop-up events, if you notice, it's hard to see a bit on that slide, but in the middle there on the plinth is a, a tree, one of these trees you can get from craft centres. Uh, and on that tree are various um, luggage labels. And what we encourage people to do uh, is when they came to see us and have a free cup of tea is to write prayer requests uh, down on the luggage labels and hang them on the tree. Now, I'm sure some people have seen that done before in, in church gatherings, but we did it out on, uh, in, our, in our gatherings in the park. And at the end of our uh, sessions in the park, we'd be there for a couple of hours, two or three hours, we would have a prayer meeting in the park. And we would bring together all the labels that have been put on the tree and we would pray the prayers that had been prayed by people who had given us to us. So what we saw was that even there, there's interaction where our prayer life crashes into our, our life together as we're out and about in the street. And we see that uh, these, these three strands, just in that little tent there, prayer, mission, and hospitality, taking place together. 
But by this time, we felt that God was definitely calling us to pear tree and to this, this dodgy building that was falling down. And um, over half a million pounds was raised uh, through um, lottery grants and others uh, to renovate the church. Uh, and the building is now watertight and structurally sound. A new catering kitchen, toilets and heating uh, were installed and three phase electricity. Um, and um, an interesting part of our project as we restored it was, was this hoardings project. You can see uh, around the side here of the church are uh, a series of, of paintings. We worked with uh, local people from all faiths and backgrounds and got them all to paint tw uh, about 250 odd postcards uh, describing what they felt was in the church and what the church meant to them uh, and what it meant to their neighbourhood. Uh, and we collected them into 25 themes and we worked with a local artist um, who painted these windows. They looked like almost like windows into the church. Um, and they were up around the church as we restored this church for about 18 months. Uh, and not one bit of graffiti, not one bit of vandalism. They were just left pristine condition. Uh, people obviously really enjoyed looking at them. So much so that we, we took them all up down and we put them up inside the church. Uh, and they remain inside the church for us uh, whilst we're still doing work inside the church and act as a bit of a, a focus for our worship. Um, the building was rededicated in 2016 uh, by a visit from uh, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And we began to see the building now was open and usable. And how could we look at prayer, mission, hospitality? How could we go about building this church as the people of God? Well, we turned to study. Uh, and Beth and I love our books um, and Beth will tell you a bit about one particular book that began to speak to us. Yeah I think we were looking for a, a shape for the community that we were building um, and like I said before I think I'd, I'd had this interest in new monastic communities. We read a book called uh, Cave Refractory Road um, um, by Ian Adams and um, it was really helpful in think, helping us think through um, like traditional monastic practices and how they could apply to our lives now, even if we don't live in a monastery, um, um, and um, how we can have that radical commitment to the Christian life in spirituality, in community, in mission. Um, it was a great way of yeah thinking about those practices. Um, and how that works with the modern modern life and actually how some of those practices are essential for surviving modern life as a Christian or as anyone. Um, so in that, in, that, in that book, he talked about the idea of the cave, which is the replace of retreat, of silence, um, of encountering God. Um, and then the refectory, which is the place of, oh, thank you, there's the link. Um, the place of eating together, which you see we already started doing, um, the place of community, um, and then the road, which was um, the place of the opening up of opportunity to encounter others, like we were already doing, going out into the park and chatting to people. Um, so those ideas became central to how we began to think about the community, um, that we were committed to prayer, that we wanted to be hospitable with each other and reaching out um, that we wanted to do mission and that really helped us to um, yeah have some thinking behind why those those things were important to us and how they could um, be a, a way that we could do the Christian life together. Cheers Beth and so you can see God was beginning to shape us as a pneumonastic community but we hadn't realised it but we began to realise that that actually was what God was calling us to and had been drawing us to over the last few years. And as we prayerfully looked at those models of monasticism, um, again, to pick up loads of books, uh, Beth and I got a vertical library investigating the various different models of monasticism. Um, I began to explore how this linked to this, this wretched church building that we seem to have been called to, to repair. Uh, and I began to look at monastic buildings and I realised that they weren't just places of worship. There were also schools, hospitals, guest houses. And I wonder, is God calling us to not just see St. Thomas's as a place of worship, but as a place of conversation, a place of prayer, a place of refreshment? 
And as we uh, carried on our prayerful study together in our small group at the time at Beth's house, um, we realised that those early monasteries and the later convents uh, were themselves dedicated to that practice of prayer, hospitality and mission. And we were particularly struck by a short booklet called Seven Sacred Spaces, written by a man called George Lings, who worked at the church army. And we began to get quite excited. So um, I invited George Lings to come and visit us. And he came and he spent two to three hours with me and he got very excited as well. Uh, and we did a whole theological reflection together on, on what was happening for us. Um, it led to a chapter in his more substantial book called Seven Sacred Spaces by George Lins. Um, uh, what he helped me to see was that the new physical spaces in our building could echo our monastic life, both as individuals and as a community. And as we looked at this, this church, which we've been sort of called to, I identified not just seven, but eight sacred spaces that could potentially be created. I'm going to try my share screen again, if I can make it work. The space, um, the prayer cell, uh, the place to be alone with God. So we converted our lady chapel into a space of prayer. And many um, people from the local community come, light candles in the space of prayer. Chapel, the place to worship. And we restored our, our chancel area as a place of devotion and praying for others. The library, the place for learning to grow knowledge. This is actually at our Heart Edge event that we hosted in St Thomas's Church. That's there, that was at Heart Edge. Our chapter room. A place for discussion, exchanging ideas and holding meetings together. The cloister, which is the place where the world and the church met. It's where they used to give out the dole money. It's a place of mission. The refectory, uh, a place for eating together, a place for sharing meals. The garden, the place of work, a place of labour and productivity. And the infirmary, a space for healthy work and for rest. There you can see our hoardings on the inside. I'll explain why I'm using that picture in a few moments. And what was really interesting as I had that theological reflection with, with George Lings uh, in, in our church was that we discovered that actually it wasn't just about creating physical spaces. We began to see that our spaces of discipleship overlap with our spaces, our physical spaces. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just about sacred spaces in a building. It was about sacred spaces in our lives, in our time. Where was the time allocated in our lives as individuals and as community to these eight sacred callings? So I attended a, a, a conference at Lambeth Palace uh, with um Archbishop Justin, and um, I met with other new monastic communities across the country. And I began to see this link between contemplative prayer, mission, and a humbler way of being church, very much the theme of today's uh, seminar. It was there that I met uh, with uh, Ian Mobsby and the Society of the Holy Trinity, and they became an important part of our next stage of our journey. Now, the Society of the Holy Trinity is an acknowledged religious community of the Church of England. We are um, a, a religious community recognised by the Church of England. Uh, and we're a community of communities. Uh, we don't have members, but have member communities. Uh, and we work across a number of principally urban areas. And these communities are made up of people who choose intentionally to intensify their discipleship in the service of mission to the church in the context of the kingdom of God. I guess you might call the Society of Holy Trinity an umbrella body for the planting of new monastic communities within the Anglican family of churches. Uh, we create a framework of support and encouragement to try and help communities become sustainable. And the constituent communities across the Society of the Holy Trinity, we each share a rhythm of life and we each share a constitution. And we share what we call spaces of belonging in each of those communities. 
So a number of us across the country, uh, uh, both new ones which are emerging all the time and, and communities that are long established in, in London, in Ipswich, ourselves. We've got new communities growing in the south of east of England, growing in the north of England, growing in, uh, in Scotland. And we work together and pray together. So let's tell you a bit more about this. And I'm going to hand it back over to Beth again to talk a bit about our spaces of belonging. Yeah, so the, uh, the communities in the Society of the Holy Trinity are set up. There are several different ways of being a member of the community. Um, and it might depend on your, your personal circumstances or how you're feeling called into that. So we call them spaces of belonging. So um, you have some who are what we call professed. So we take um, a seasonal vow. So every year we take vows um, to keep to the rhythm of life, which I think Sam's going to tell you about a bit more about later. Um, and then so we have some people who are professed and then we have others who are companions so these are people who might be spiritually journeying with the community who aren't yet ready to become followers of Christ, um, but who want to um, live out some of the community life and be part of that. So they can be welcomed in as companions. And then we have other people who are associates. So those who might um, be really interested in what we're doing as a community, but live further away or not be able to participate as much. So they can, um, they can participate from afar. Um, as associates and then we have participants who are people who are committed to following Christ um, but not quite ready to um, commit to the seasonal vows for whatever reasons personal reasons or um, family commitments and things like that um, but who participate regularly in the community life um, so we have these different ways of belonging to the church and you might be able to change between those um, you might journey from um, being a companion to coming to know Christ and then committing more to the um, to the community um, or you might find that the commitment's been too much and you've got other things on you, in your life at that moment so you can stand back a bit but we're all part of um, the community and there's not a hierarchy of this is the inner circle and this is the hangers-on um, but there's just different ways of interacting and being part of the community and um, seeing how God is calling you into that. Thanks, Beth. So, yes, this, uh, this rhythm of life that we uh, make a profession to before the bishop uh, every year. We've done it twice and we're preparing for our third profession now. Um, we make eight promises. And you wouldn't believe it, uh, or maybe perhaps God was behind it. Uh, these eight promises uh, reflect our eight sacred spaces. Uh, that I was talking about a few moments ago. So let me just take you through uh, these eight uh, practices of our rhythm of life. So the first is the, the practice of prayer, uh, which I link to our cell. Uh, and that's the question which we are asked by the bishop. And in our particular case, in St. Thomas's community, we commit to daily prayer, uh, to contributing to an email circle, which we pray for one another, for our St. Thomas community and for the wider world. And each member each day sends out a, an email so that over the week, we've all sent out an email uh, to one another. So we all share something about our lives together. Uh, there's a daily service of Compline or a time of gathering together uh, for study or a midweek Eucharist. Uh, but uh, out of the, the week, there's five days of the week, there's always something of an opportunity for you to be involved in praying with the community. Then the practice of devotion, which I linked to that sacred space of the chapel, a space for worship with others. Uh, and we have opportunities to worship together. Uh, particularly on a Sunday. We're a very diverse group. Uh, some of us are Anglo-Catholic, some of us are evangelical, some of us are charismatic. Uh, so our worship takes many different forms, from evening prayer to formal Eucharist to creative prayer to the agape shared meal that we have together. Um, and we commit to, to sharing our time and our skills and our resources together uh, and uh, giving to sustain the work of the St Thomas's community. Uh, the practice of learning which I, I linked to the library I mentioned a few moments ago. And um, we commit ourselves to godly study, to reading the Bible, to exploring prayer practices, 
which I'm Bethel say a bit in a minute ago, to go um, uh, to deepen our faith. And we study the Bible together and we read and discuss spiritual books uh, during Advent and Lent. And sometimes in the summer, we have a book, a book club and, and we read and share together. And then the practice of reconciliation, uh, the, uh, the chapter room. Uh, and we're committing to nurture our common life by listening to one another, contributing honestly and acting in compassion with each person, looking for opportunities to share with one another. Uh, we, and we do this particularly for our, our weekly journey together time. Uh, we have an hour before our service every, every, every week where we serve together. Uh, we seek to sometimes do things in the community, uh, the clear ups or go and do those cups of tea in the park. Or we simply sit together in a circle and share with one another our, our lives and our story. But it's a practice of um, seeking to walk alongside with one another in life, not just sitting in rows when you come to church, um, but actually being practical and, and living with one another. Uh, the practice of serving others. We want to make the building welcoming, safe, shared and sacred. Uh, and we're working with other organisations and local organisations and many different organisations we've worked with at different times and different spaces where we've been here to give out meals to hungry children. We've provided a uniform, we've provided a sexual health clinic for sex workers in the area, we've provided a drop-in uh, for refugee clothing, we provide a place uh, of food storage. We, we just different times, God's led us to different types of compassionate action. The practice of hospitality, of sharing food together and welcoming others to join us. Uh, and we want to have opportunities to both feed ourselves and build our fellowship, but also include others and invite others to participate in food at our table. As I say, we, we offer food on a regular basis uh, to a number of different projects and local events. Uh, the practice of following Christ in our work. Uh, the garden in the case of the, of the monks was the place of work. It was where they, they made their, their Benedictine ales. It's where they made their wines. It's where they got their income from. Um, and we commit to working out our faith in our daily lives, uh, whether that be at home or at work or in our place of learning. Uh, and we're looking to try and find ways to share about our life and our work and support one another. And one of the dreams that we've got is to, to create a place of daily prayer in the church where people from the local area can come in and pray on a daily basis to support them. And the practice of maintaining our well-being, which I linked to that infirmary. We commit to looking after ourselves in body, mind and spirit, recognising that God cares for our whole of our lives. Uh, and we're looking for practical ways and we're, we're actively at the moment looking for ways that we can offer love and partial care for both one another, but also for others around us to, to build up uh, what is good, is true and beautiful in all. So that's our, our, our rhythm of life. And I'm going to hand back over to Beth again. Because when we took our first profession, uh, it was in March the 9th, 2020. And um, we all know what happened 16 days later. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Beth to see what happened in that first year of our profession. Yeah, so we'd just taken our vows and we felt like here we are on this exciting adventure to um, doing this new thing. And we had plans to meet with this group of Muslim women who wanted to cook together and we thought great this is going to be wonderful we're going to be out in the community uh no we found ourselves at home uh in lockdown um and suddenly we weren't even able to meet together in person um so like everyone else we became very familiar with this format of zoom and first of all it was great and you know it's fun to see inside other people's houses and what they've got on their bookshelves and um it was a real blessing in keeping us connected um, but it wasn't long before we were longing to meet together in person again um, but I feel like uh, that first lockdown having this rhythm of life that we had committed to having a rhythm of daily prayer of um, that commitment really helped in kind of coping with the unknownness of what was happening um, and so we started um, yeah, using Zoom to pray together, to connect together. Um, and we carried on with our um, studying. Some of us took um, an online course in contemplative Christianity and started to dig in a bit more to different um, prayer practices. 
Um, we studied a book together um, called Original Prayer, which introduced us to um, some of the practices that monastics have used over the years um, to draw close to God. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that became a blessing, and it still is, we started doing Compline together in an evening, and it was um, a real blessing for to have that moment of connection with each other and that moment in the evening to um, give the day back to God, to connect with God, um, to have a bit of silence together. Um, and I don't think that would have happened without discovering Zoom and discovering online because it's just not practical. Though we live close together, it is not practical for us to actually gather for for, for 15 minutes, is what, which is what we do. Um, but online, it's it's easy. We can do that. And um, it's been a great um, part of um, our spiritual practice together to do that and to commit to that time together and to um, have that moment to um yeah reconnect with god in our day um so some of the blessings i guess of of the covid time yes it's by lavinia burn i have it here Back. <laughs> thank you and um for me i think the biggest part of compliment which i find so brilliant in the middle of it is that it's examined uh, and that sense of reflecting back over the day and seeing the times of consolation, the times of desolation, seeing where God has touched us during the day. And, that, and for me, that's, that's been a lifeline uh, for the last, all the way through um, lockdown and into, into now. Um, so where do we think God is calling us now as we come out of lockdown? Uh, we're in a period of change. Uh, we're in a period of prayerful discernment. Uh, and we do feel and sense that there's some exciting things beginning to bubble up. Uh, but we're not quite sure exactly where we see God is leading us to next. But we do feel uh, and sense that this practice of work and this practice of well-being, those two sacred spaces, in not just in our physical building, but in our time, uh, are perhaps things that we need to work a bit more on. Uh, we've done quite a lot of work on our prayer life, a lot of work on worship, a lot of time thinking about study uh, and working what it is to live with one another. It tends to think about working out to those who are excluded and hospitality. What does this work and this well-being call to be? And um, we went back to where we started. We went back to these, these three focuses of mission, of hospitality, of prayer. Uh, and we went back to um, looking at uh, values as to what we stand for. Uh, that we value uh, creating a safe space, a place where we wanted to include the excluded and the marginalised. We wanted to create a shared space uh, where we look out to others and everyone plays a part in building the community. And because we value time spent with those people, we want to create a sacred space that nurtures growth and faith in individuals. And these three things came back to me as we reflected and prayed together about what it was, what God's calling to us next. And um, in conversation with partners, we were a very exciting project as began to emerge which we're not quite sure where it's taking us, uh, but I was going to show the last few remaining slides. Make it work. Okay. So, um, we want to, uh, first of all, think about a safe place to live safe place to live uh, behind our church is this dreadful church hall it's been a bit of a bane in my life ever since i took on the church in 2011 it's been a magnet for all sorts of um fly tipping it's been a magnet for the drug addicts uh, and thousands of needles around the area it, every time we clear the site another load of fly tipping comes and get dumped on it uh, the rats run ragged uh, and what we want to do is to knock down this hall and we're going to work with a christian charity uh, called Green Pastures uh, to create 15 to 20 uh, bespoke studio flats uh, as move on accommodation for the Christian run hostel, which is about half a mile up the road. And the Christians are running the hostel for the homeless just up the road. But the problem is, those folks there need to move on uh, into accommodation that helps them to live independently. And so I think are creating these 15 to 20 studio flats. And then inside the church, 
I did promise to tell you why I wanted to show you that picture uh, for infirmary at that part of the building. Uh, this is what I'm seeing as a shared space to thrive. You want to reshape that half of the building uh, as a place that can support those guys who are going to move into the accommodation uh, outside, uh, providing training and support, uh, providing a, a home for organisations across our city that offer guidance and support and things like life skills, social skills, employability skills, number of Christian projects that we know that have popped up around lockdown but have no physical base to provide a base of support for the folk who are moving to behind us. So we see the infirmary and the dormitory uh, beginning to appear in our monastic building, potentially, as shared space to thrive. And the sacred space to nurture faith. We don't want to stop being the church. Uh, that's the church at the front of our building, that on the left-hand side, that's what it looks like. Uh, and it's a, a real focal point for our worship. And we want to nurture faith. Uh, we want us to work with the people who are coming in uh, to help them to shape a well-being that emerges from a rhythm of life, from a well-balanced lifestyle that works together and offers spiritual support to all We're not sure yet how that vision is going to take shape. And that's where we're back to prayer. Uh, and we're right at the moment, uh, as we start Lent in a few weeks' time, about to embark on a process of uh, discernment, uh, of prayerful reflection, uh, as we work together to work out what that vision means. Back again to see how prayer leads us to action, action leads us back to prayer. And I hope you can see from our presentation today how St Tom's community has evolved as a prayer-based community. The merge of a project to restore an old church as a centre to serve our community to now becoming a new monastic community based around prayer, mission and hospitality. You've heard how prayer and Compline has become less focused on intercession uh, and it's become more on constant reflective prayer, examine. We don't just pray and meditate together though, we work together, we eat together, we care for one another when they're sick. When I got COVID, the community were wonderful. They came and bought me loads of meals and looked after me amazingly. We acknowledge the goodness of God in our lives. As part of our emerging vision for St Thomas Community, we now want to establish how can we care for others? And we're looking at this move on accommodation for homeless as Eddie Darstalls. What is our role? We want to introduce these people to a loving Christian community, walking with them, helping them to be formed or perhaps reformed by God's wonderful love, just as he reforms and forms us. As we respond to the love of God, we seek to be that love to others as well as to ourselves. And we're at three o'clock and I'm handing back to Kath or Catherine, not sure which, uh, to answer Q&A. No. Well, thank you so much, uh, Simon and Beth. That was uh, really fantastic. Um, uh, really wonderful to hear to hear the story. Uh, fantastic the way that you that you that you framed it and and just drew out so many different elements. I mean, I've been scribbling notes all over the place because there's so much that I feel like I want to uh, pick up on and and reflect on myself and. And I'm, I'm sure that there'll be others with us today who probably feel the same way. Just one thing for me, I particularly love that the thing in Isaiah 61, picking up the particular that it's, it's they, it's the people who are mourning, they and them who are going to be the ones who are doing the rebuilding. Um, so I love that. That really um, chimes with my kind of love of the idea of us working with others and, and seeing what, what everyone has got to, to bring um, together. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Um, there are some questions here. Um, I think what I could, um, well, maybe I'll just, I'll just go through the questions. People might want to ask them themselves. So we get a mixture of voices. It was mainly, um, you talked about obviously your setting in, in Derby and you spoke about other communities, but you mentioned Ipswich and places like that which all sounded very urban environments. 
How do you envisage something like this working in, say, a more rural benefits type of system? Yeah, the Society of Trinity had a, had a long conversation about this as to whether we, we, we should see that all domestic communities could become under the Society of Trinity. Uh, we still haven't resolved that question. Uh, part of the religious orders is that we always work together and work together as a commonality to provide a common ground. Um, part of it is, is, is understanding what we call charism in monasticism, uh, which is, is particularly is what is your particular calling and being very clear about what our particular calling is. And because the groups that's come together at the moment are, are largely from outer states and inner city areas, in terms of work, it's been very much our calling to these sorts of areas. That doesn't mean to say God isn't calling other people to do the same thing in other, elsewhere, but the particular group that we've allied with have got a similar context. Mm -hmm. So it might be that we, we see uh, another society that moves out and begins to explore some of this in the context of rural issues. I do know there are some which are doing some really good projects. Um, there's the Columba community in, on, on the, um, the North Downs is doing a really cracking job uh, working in rural areas, working on a converted farm, and they're keeping sheep, uh, and they're talking to people on the North Downs way when they come past in a pilgrimage and creating a pilgrimage centre. Um, so I could certainly put you in touch with them. Um, and they're doing a very good project there. Um, that's with, um, oh, I've his name now. Um, Greg Valerian? That's it. Not a few members. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank, thanks very much for that. It was just as, you know, it'd be, in, it'd be nice to have those, those contacts that you mentioned. So if someone could flag them up on the chat, that would be brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, what I wanted to know was, you said you said we quite a lot, but who is we? Uh, both in the sense of, you know, how many people are are involved, um, how many are in the kind of core team who do what I presume is quite a lot of work behind the scenes to organise all this and work towards this the, the vision that you've got. And where have you got these people from? Were they part of the existing congregation, or have you attracted a lot of new people? in those things I'll take that one, um so we are quite small um now how many people did we actually so 10 or 12 people who are kind of core i guess we have other people who come in and out and people um in terms of where we came from so um my, me and my husband were part of saint augustine's which is the other parish church within the parish um and um there was a couple of other people as well and simon's obviously the vicar um the community vicar um of the parish um so we came from from there but then um we've had other people join who um have come from other anglican churches um or who have come from other um more charismatic pentecostal churches in Derby, but found they were called more to a local expression of church instead of joining us. I mean, Simon is kind of the person who knows everyone. And so a lot of people have, um, have come through knowing Simon um, in other contexts, um, have come to you know, be part of the community. And then we've had other people who have just turned up, um, who've moved into the area, seen the church and come along. Um, we've got a poster outside saying when we, when we meet, so people have kind of joined that way. Um, so in terms of the building things, Simon has been the lead in, in kind of practical building things. Um, and then I've kind of come along and assist with kind of um, like leading services or um, we have a, a rotor for hosting Compline every week. So we take it in turns to do that. Um, and then when we meet together, we all kind of contribute in those things as well. Is that fair, Simon? Yeah, I think so. We very much should. Everyone does their own bit uh, and joins in. Uh, I have this thing about I hating rotors. Uh, I think rotors tend to mean people tend to come on the day they're, they're down to do something and they don't come the day they're not down to do something. So we, we, we just all turn up at four o'clock and whatever needs to be done, people muck in and do it. So you might find you know, somebody's cleaning or washing up or serving tea or setting up a, the techie stuff and at different people each week do different bits and pieces. Um, Thank you. Anderson, do you want... You talk about the community, but um, was there much resistance from 
the community that aren't involved in this project? You know, are they saying, you know, we've been coming here for the last 100 years and, um, you know, um, and you've you've arrived and taking over? Yeah, very good question. Very good question. I'm incredibly fortunate. Um, I, I was recruited. Um, the, the, it's a bit of a backdrop. It might answer another question that I saw came up as well. Uh, there were four parishes, four Anglican parishes in, in the inner city here in Derby, and they formed into one team ministry. Um, sadly, over time, over the last um, 20 odd years, um, they've now dwindled down to one parish church. And those three parish churches have all gradually closed down and moved in. Uh, this particular church was closed two weeks after I was licensed in it, um, partly due to the physical state of the water pouring through the roof, etc. Um, and I was specifically recruited because of my background in community regeneration and community development, um, which I'd done before I was a vicar. Uh, I was specifically recruited to, on a job description, to reconnect the Church of England in this particular four parishes to the local community and to reconnect with uh, the wider charity and statutory sector around about us. And particularly uh, in, the J, in the job description, it said um, to find a new way of imagining to use the St Thomas Church. Um, they didn't know what it meant. They just felt it had something in there that potentially that it could be, it had some use. We weren't quite sure what or how. Um, and partly because of my background and experience in, in regeneration, I, I made loads of links with people. Uh, but partly because of my freedom not to be actually leading a, a traditional church congregation, but to actually get out there and meet people, um, and I suppose you could call pioneer minister style. I, I very much had that connection to people outside the church more than inside the church. Um, so, yeah, there's a there's a, a different way of doing ministry. Um, Catherine's saying that she'd like to hear more about um, the companions who are part of the community, because I think, Beth, you mentioned that some would they wouldn't call themselves Christians. So Catherine is asking, is asking, how did they get involved and how does this work in practice? So in our community, uh, we have one companion who's actually Simon's daughter. So she is kind of a companion because she's not, she's not old enough to take vows. You have to be, um, um, the, the, the Society of the Trinity has, has decided that's how it works. But um, I think in, this is, this is something that's, um, that the Society of the Holy Trinity has in other communities. And I think perhaps it works differently. I do, do you know anything, Simon, about the other communities and, and how the companion space of the long Yeah, there? I think it would work really well when we if we go for this uh, work with the with the, the wean pastures and the homeless uh, move on accommodation. I can imagine some of them would might want to become a companions with us, uh, but might not actually share our faith, but actually really want to be part of the story. Uh, so that'd be part, I can imagine that would be an example of where they might work. It's also worked for our junior members. Uh, one of the brilliant things about our group is that, in addition to my daughter, we have Beth's uh, two children uh, and another family have another two children. So we've got a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, and then my 15-year-old uh, and my 18-year-old, who acts as a bit of a bit of a support and look after the children. But we, we, the, our services, if you call them services, are, are very full of noise and lots of excitement and exciting children running around. And children climbing up and down the pulpit steps and exploring the building as if it's their sort of their playground. And I absolutely love that because it's a sense that this is a place that is as much a home for them as their own home. We really wanted to make it have a homely feel uh, and a sense of this is where we we live and work and play together. Uh, and so they make dens underneath the table and sit together. And we 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 light um, not real candles but electric candles underneath the and underneath the underneath the table. Uh, and they and they had their, their their prayerful reflection time underneath the table in a den together, uh, in that sense of trying to introduce some contemplative prayer techniques, even for three, four, five, six year olds. <laughs> I think that the, that companion space of belonging um, in other, they've so I know Ian Mobsby, who's the the person who's kind of in charge and has, has um, founded the the Society of the Holy Trinity, um, very much goes uh, works with um, people who are spiritual but not religious. <laughs> And in that sense, having this place of um, learning about spirituality and wanting to follow in that and wanting to be part of it, but not quite ready to commit to the kind of explicitly Christian aspect, I suppose. And that's so that companion place has a, a place for people to belong before they believe, I guess, is the idea. Thank you. And uh, 
Would you like to ask your question, which is also about the people involved, I think? Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm always really interested in how we um, translate some of our churchiness for the kinds of people who live in the kind of community that you painted such a great picture of. So I'm wondering when you say we, how many of the we is made up of people that are drawn from that community? And, and have you got any lessons or hints and tips about how we translate? Because I, I, I love all this stuff, but I wonder how it translates to somebody who left school with one CSE in, you know, cooking or something like that. And how we how we transform people's lives without gentrifying them, I guess, is where I'm going. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Uh, I just sort of thought uh, when someone was asking the, que the question as well, someone asked about how did how did the community feel about this happening, and and so the person that so we have one member who's a member of St Thomas Community and has been at this church St Thomas's Church um, since he was a child, um, mm -hmm. and you know so he's grown up and lived in that area, and, that, <laughs> and he's like one of the most high church people there. So it's quite an interesting that. The, the the community that we live in is quite religious and in some so because and the other aspect being the immigration aspects and so Simon mentioned people who want to come in and light candles so in some senses the people around already have that those kind of religious ideas about what a church is mm -hmm. and they've come from Catholic backgrounds and uh yeah want to do that want to interact in that way um so that's kind of one area but yeah um the other is that Quite a lot of us are either have moved in from other places or yeah are outsiders um and i think that's one of the challenges we've got yeah it is it, one of the things that we should we were reflecting last night about why we come to st thomas's and about you know three or four people said it's my local church um, but quite a lot of people said i, I feel called to it uh, and we've uh, we haven't promoted it we haven't put adverts out we haven't talked about it in a big huge campaign it's been very much word of mouth, um, but people who have who come and walked alongside us for a bit or joined in with us, it sensed that sense of calling that they were, were being called to be part of it. And in some ways, I see the echoes back to the religious communities of the 19th century, uh, that they were called to, to serve in a particular area. One of my favourite TV programmes is called The Midwife, uh, and that sense of the call the midwife model is that there is both the called um, prayerful, faithful nuns, be the faithful, prayerful presence who work alongside the professionals in the nurses, the midwives, and that's what we hope the people who run the, the homeless unit with us will be the professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they are out and about in the community and become part of the community, become accepted by the community, and actually loved by the community because of the nature of what they're doing in the community and in the, in the public face of the community. And so that was part of my sort of vision of what I felt God was calling us to be that sort of community. As I said right at the beginning about making sure that we're visible. Um, so that's quite important for me. And, and as Beth said, we do see, not every week, but we see on a fairly regular basis, people coming along and, and dropping in and saying hello and coming to see us, lighting candles, um, being part of the story. Uh, and I think as we as we reopen more, as, as lockdown sort of ends and we're back to normal, inverted commas, um, we're going to be much more, hopefully seeing more of that. Yeah, I think one of my, one of my dreams for, for the community is to reflect the community around us and to be made up of those people as well and um yeah how we move into that direction i don't know and we certainly see a couple of people come in and actually become members of the community who are one was an ex homeless man who's come and joined us uh, one is uh, ex time seeker who's come and join us we've had people immigrant communities come and join us so we have had people drawn to us in the last few months and last year or two um from so we, we we wonder why God's brought those people along, and maybe that's part of Beth's just saying about actually God is now calling us back into re engagement with the community now that the lockdown is, is, is eased and we can, can go back and re engage. And we've got people with youngsters who can teach us some skills around cross cultural engagement, uh, as we just got, uh, and around engagement with those people who are disadvantaged. Thank you. Uh, and you were asking about how things, how things are, it's promoted. Is that, has that, what Simon and Beth have just been saying, has that gone some way to answer that question or do you want to t take it a bit further, to ask a bit more? Well, I mean, from, from what Simon's just said, they don't promote it, so yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the answer. I mean, I was just wondering because, uh, you know, uh, I'm a curate and we get a lot of 
a lot of training at theological college about mission and i would like to do something that was very missional uh, involving contemplative uh, prayer but um it's quite hard to know who it is that you are kind of aiming it at how you would describe it so it makes sense um how you make it clear to people that it's contemplative but it's not a secular thing you know it seems like it's an odd space yeah i think it is it is an odd space in between and, and i always have this big discussion with, with the community on a regular basis so that we are christ church we're clearly part of christ church we clearly are church but we're not traditional church in terms of where you would expect church to be um in terms of that you come up to church on sunday and it's all done for you at the front and and you know you can slip on the back row and, and slip out again. There's no hiding place when you come into a community of 10, 12 people and you're sitting in a circle around a table eating. Um, so that sense of uh, you, you're joining a relational community. But in that case, what, how we are formed and how we are shaped as that relational community is really important in terms of how that impacts on the way we engage with people. Um, and so the way we're shaped is an important part of the, of the spiritualism. Thank you. Uh, do you want to come in with your question here? Yeah, so this is uh, a question about um, your, uh, it's about perception, I guess. Um, does the other church uh, in the parish, uh, the whatever you described as Simon, I can't remember, quite a normal church, we'll call it that, um, uh, have any, uh, or does it articulate any opinions about uh, what you're doing, which must seem very other, um, is it? Um, do you see yourself, or are you perceived by either your neighbouring parish or by the diocese as a um, uh, a source of uh, hope, inspiration, challenge, disturbance, any of those, um, or because it seems to me, because the numbers you're talking about and the work you've done. That seems to be quite extraordinary. Are you so um, absorbed by all that that um, those other things, which I guess obsess those of us who are in ordinary parish ministry, whatever that is, um, uh, have, have you know we see happening ac across the border, but we we have little time for, no energy for. I think is probably what I mean, rather than no time. I'll say and Beth might want to chip in. Um, I think we, I've tried to, when, I, when we first sat down and, and thought about, well, we, if God was calling us to reopen church as church and not just as church building, but church as people, I wanted to strip back to what is the essential elements of what the church was. And I didn't want it to, to bring in all the baggage of uh, our parish church. So I really prayerfully reflected what are the, the core essentials of what I really felt God was wanting us to do in that area and not to get bogged down with um, with, with too too much baggage of what it meant to be church. Um, and in that respect, um, when we when we took our profession before the, the, the bishops um, for our, our, our rhythm of life, one of the things we do is to serve the church and the wider church and the and the and the um, and the deanery in the diocese. Um, I'm acting as area dean at the moment, uh, and uh, because the community meets in the afternoon, uh, and we have our meet afternoon tea together, and then we have uh, worship together, I'm free in the mornings. So I, I go round uh, different churches, covering different churches in the morning, uh, and and speak at different churches and help them out in churches in vacancy. Uh, and, and the St Thomas Community Act is my place of of um, sustenance. It's my place where I find my prayerful reflection. Um, I said to Beth and the team last night when I arrived at church last night, building last night, I said, I'm just a punter tonight. It's your call. You do whatever you want because I'm quite tired tonight. I'm exhausted. And I just sat down and, and let them feed me. Uh, and there is something around uh, that, that very much the community acts to feed one another uh, because we vicars spend a lot of time giving out. So a number of vicars have done that. They have come to us. We've had several people who come and join us at different times, sit and watch what we're doing, come and learn from what we're doing. We've had various curates and lay readers and community workers and various other people on placement at different times who come with us for certain amounts of time and season. I think we've trained up three curates, I think, and um, two lay readers. Uh, and we've got, some of them have stayed on as being associates with us uh, and they come and they 
uh, come once a month to the, perhaps the communion service just to to reconnect with us and then take back to to the uh, to their churches. Um, so Beth wants to add anything extra to that? Only that that's a, it's a big question that we're thinking of, isn't it? Our relationship to St Augustine's and our relationship as a as a parish. How do we work as a parish? We have these two buildings. Um, I guess my heart is for us to do things together. We, I guess in some ways we're seen as a ministry of the parish. Um, they've tried to kind of, first we talked about two hubs for a while, didn't we? Of St Augustine's building and St Thomas's building and just doing, doing things in different ways. Um, so hopefully it complements, I guess, what happens at St Augustine's, but yeah, it's also, and, and because some of us, started out in St Augustine's it was almost like a church plant but not quite and are we a fresh expression or so there's lots of questions about how it fits together um which we're still working out I think. Yeah we're still at that working out phase at the moment in terms of our relationship with the Anglican superstructure around us, what, what that means. Uh, I won't say the words bishop mission and all of it some of you know what exactly I'm talking about when I say that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just aware that we're coming to the end of our time together, so um, I think we've picked up most of the questions, maybe not all, but hopefully um, hopefully we've, we've, we've touched on quite a breadth of, of things uh, for everybody. Um, now, has asked um, how, um, how we can pray for you um, at St Thomas Derby, so maybe you might like to, to say something about that. I think um, I said it towards the end in my conclusion that we're in this um, important phase now of as we emerge out of lockdown, as we come into our third year profession uh, to work out what is our vision for uh, engaging with the wider community, engaging with the, with the neighbourhood now that lockdown for so things have all gone. Um, and so that sense of looking at those particular space of work, that space of well-being, um, could that link to this potential project with homeless move on? And, and just uh, this prayerful discernment process we're about to embark on for, for Lent and for into into the um, Easter period. Of, you know, where is where is God taking us now? Um, we thought it was all going to happen, and then it suddenly changed with, with with lockdown. And God took us deeper into prayer in lockdown, and deeper into Him in lockdown. And now we've got this opportunity to think again: well, where we are now? Where does that take us next? Stage? And probably I don't know if Beth wants to say anything else, but probably that relationship with the parish and that's the thing. At working out what that is and what that structure looks like and that relationship works like looks like into the longer term yeah thank you um i was actually going to ask you simon to pray at the end so having asked you how we can pray for you are you happy to pray at the end anyway we'll we'll, we'll do that and um no yeah, thank you so much for everyone for for being here um we do have another um session next Monday, where we'll be uh, joined by um, the Foundation, uh, which is uh, a contemplative, creative um, service and community um, in Bristol. Um, so we'll be hearing from them. So another, uh, uh, um, quite a different story there. So we really do encourage you to, to join us there. Um, it, yeah, I'd really want to thank both Simon and Beth for everything that they've shared uh, today and um, to everyone who's joined in and thank you so much for your questions um, you know I hope that you feel that you've got plenty to go away and think about and um, and yes do do join us again uh, next time and we really yeah um, uh, are just very excited about creating this space to hear about um, what what God is doing in this area so Simon um, or Beth I don't know which of you would like to pray as we draw to a close now. I was going to pray the, um, the compliment prayer, if that's okay. This is the prayer we, we pray each night uh, and it, it, um, it speaks to me massively. Loving and merciful God, as the night falls or this meeting closes, we bring before you our experiences of the day, the joys and the challenges. We give thanks for the moments of connection, 
and insight. And we pray that we may learn from the mistakes and the disappointments. We pray for our city, we pray for each of our contexts, for all those who work, for our safety and well-being. And we pray for all those who are reaching out to you. May they know your healing and transformative love. Amen. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, goodbye to everyone.